now. Hello, everybody. I'm your host, Felipe Malicio, and you're listening to the Total Basis Podcast. And with me is my backup host, Austin Spiro. Austin, how are you doing this evening? I'm all right, Felipe. How are you doing, man? I'm, I'm all right. I'm myself, I'm just waiting for my uh, black tea, the weirded pirate to finally kick in so I can give everybody the show that they deserve as we recap the American League series and the National League series. And we will start off wasting no time. Oh, wait, wait, wait. Before we do, Austin, tell the good folks out there where they can find you on your podcast and everything like that. All right. So I have my own podcast and Felipe has been a frequent guest on there. I've had a number of uh, baseball life group members on there and I always appreciate you guys coming on there, but the podcast is the round trippers podcast. Um, I am available on Spotify and Google podcasts and anywhere else that you are probably listening to podcasts. Um, You can also find the podcast on Twitter under the Twitter handle round underscore trippers. And of course, you can find our podcast at the Life Group Podcast. And if you're listening to the audio only, we are we go live at the Baseball Life Facebook group. So without further ado, we got a lot to cover and we're hoping to get it all done within the hour so we can all go and watch Monday night wrestling football. Uh, people giving each other CTEs tonight. Also, nine games uh, and the NBA docket. Anyway, I'm getting distracted. Let's start off with the Houston Astros and the Boston Red Sox. As uh, Of course, we all know what happened there. The uh, Houston Astros won, advanced to their, what, their third World Series in the last five years. Is that correct? Is that-, that, is, that is correct. Three in the last five. Yeah, so here they come again. And as always, we look at win probability added, which is, uh, you know, just a, a nice way to say which players showed up in which games. This is an accumulated stat for this series. So the, obviously, the higher the win probability added, or otherwise known as WPA, not WAP, that's a Cardi B song. But the higher the WPA <laughs> song is, I mean, like, the higher the WPA, the more crucial the hitter or pitcher showed up for their team's series. So let's get going. At the top of the list is Jordan Alvarez, followed by Jose Altuve, Jason Castro, who went two for three and only, yeah, yeah, two for three. Oh, wow. Must have been, uh, what, pinch hitting there? Yeah, I'm sure he was pinch hitting. And uh, um, I'm going to ask this. Where was this Jason Castro when you were on the Angels? Come on. Jason Castro's always been a player that can hit the ball really hard. Um, That's, you know, that's like his one saving grace as a hitter. He's been pretty piss poor, uh, even in his days with the Astros. But he was always a a guy who can really just, all his stat cast numbers look very uh, delicious, I guess, for lack of a better term at this point. And uh, yeah, he got a one point. No, I'm sorry, a two point four six seven uh, on base plus slugging percentage in the series with the one home run, the two RBI, the two walk. Didn't strike out once, which is another Jason Castro thing that he likes to strike out a lot. So uh, another player that came through the clutch was Carlos Correa, and Michael Brantley went seven for twenty six, and he hit two sixty nine. Nice, but he must have he had four RBI, which gave him a WPA of zero point zero three. But the highest player on the list. Definitely Jordan Alvarez. We know who Jordan Alvarez is. Uh, he got, what, well, he's the ALCS MVP, correct? He won the MVP? He did win the MVP, yep. So I, what else is there to say about Jordan Alvarez that we, we haven't said already? Uh, I don't know. I think just the fact that he's still young, you know, he's still so young and he's become an integral part of the Astros offense. And, you know, he, he really stepped up for the team. And it's really nice to see after I believe he was injured last season, wasn't he? Yeah, he's uh, had a slew of leg injuries, which I mean, he was a bad outfielder to begin with. But now that he has all those other injuries, it's more like let's just preserve you, your legs and prevent you from playing outfield and just stick you at DH, even though you're only 24 years old, which that might be the new trend now. I mean, we see it with Shohei Otane. We're hopefully, as a White Sox fan, even though I'm wearing my Cubs hat, hopefully we see that with Eloy Jimenez, guys who just shouldn't be given a glove out there. So uh, I had uh, a question for you. I had, at the beginning of the season, Jordan Alvarez is my number one designated hitter, and then Shohei Atani was like number seven on my list. Uh, I guess for next season, who's your number one designated hitter uh, going into next season? Uh, that's really tough because I have, I mean, we, when we did our, um, we did a show in the preseason, 
um, where we did a draft and we did a draft of a bunch of teams. Mm-hmm. Um, the fantasy ones we did the uh, I believe we did the A's the Red Sox and the Angels and stuff like that and I remember we were talking about Max Stassi and we were talking about how Max Stassi had a really good year and I said then I don't trust one good year I need to see another good year before I start taking them seriously now Shohei Otani didn't have a season like Max Stassi had Shohei Otani had a great, like a really great season. I mean, he struggled towards the end and after the all-star break, he had his offensive struggles, but pitching, he really turned it on and he's got double the workload as any other MLB player. Um, But I'm going to go with the same thing here and say, I don't trust one good year. Um, I want to see him put it together again. Um, Is that for Otani or is that for Alvarez? That's for, um, I'm going to, I'm leaning more towards Otani because okay. really with Otani, he's been injured the past few years or he can't pitch. He can only hit or stuff like that. Mm-hmm. So he's had, he's taken a while to put it all together. And now the question is, can he do what he did this year over a few years? Mm-hmm. And right now I don't trust one good year. I would rather lean on Jordan Alvarez, who doesn't have as big of a workload as Shohei Otani. So if you're going to ask me um, Jordan Alvarez or Shohei Otani as the number one DH, I'd go with Alvarez. Yeah, I think I might lean towards Jordan Alvarez as my number one again, but it, it might be closer than I think. The Shohei really had a wonderful season this past year. And um, I mean, we're talking about him maybe being MVP, and, and that's just not even including his pitching that he does right so but we'll see i mean it's hard because every time we think about Shohei otani we think about a guy who's always injured always hurt or there's always an excuse or he needs more rest or he needs like special treatment and he's old he's a little bit older too i think he's uh, 27 i think right i believe he's 26 27 years old yeah i remember because i'm 26 years old and i remember them saying Shohei otani's age and i was like wow he's my age i didn't know that so yeah he's right around 26 27 <laughs> Well, I, I just mentioned Al, Alvarez. Yeah, he's 27 years old. Uh, Alvarez is 24. He'll be 25 uh, by the end of June next season. So, you, you know, what's my rule here? Younger is always better. So uh, what about Jose Altuve? Uh, you know, he walked three times, struck out three times, uh, but he only hit for $1.25 and an on-base percentage of 214. Is Jose Altuve still cheating at this point? <laughs> well, I mean, statistics say... No, um, <laughs> I would, I would hope not because if he's, if he is cheating and batting 125, they need a, apparently trash cans don't work anymore or whistling doesn't work or whatever or buzzers is, or buzzers or whatever the new trend is now. Um, I really don't, I mean, we can go on and on and on about are the Astros cheating or not. I'm just going to say, I don't think they are. I don't think dusty Baker would allow for that to happen. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, I don't, I don't think he's cheating and It'll be really interesting to see if he steps up um, in the World Series um, because we're used to seeing Jose Altuve being the guy that you go up there and you know he's going to do something in the clutch. Um, Obviously, I mean, with the WPA statistic, he did do something in the clutch, but, you know, he didn't do much after that. So we'll see. Maybe he will step up. I mean, the only way he could go is up from here because he's at a 125 batting average. Yeah, and, and like we've mentioned time and time again, WPA is not a performance indicator. It's more of a game-to-game uh, metric. He Altuve hit two home runs and drove in four RBI. So that's why he's second on the list for the Astros. Uh, but he didn't hit a lot, but the few hits that he did hit, he made them count. Uh, actually, two of those hits, I'm sorry, three of his hits were the two home runs. So, <laughs> yeah, it was uh, literally boom or nothing for Altuve. And, 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 he showed up big, uh, even though he wasn't very consistent. I mean, he made those balls in play or lack of play. I don't know. But he made those uh, three hits count for something. Uh, Not only ahead. did he make those three hits count for something, but he's also getting on. He's also walking. So it's not like he's getting up there and striking out willy nilly like, um, you know, Carlos Correa. Carlos Correa had seven strikeouts in this last in this last uh, postseason. Kyle Tucker had seven strikeouts. He only had three. And he had the most walks tied with Yuli Gurriel for, and Alex Bregman for this postseason. Now, is three a whole lot in six games? I mean, you're looking at one every other game, which 
you could probably do more, but at least, you know, he's walking. He's not just striking out willy nilly and not hitting. He's still, he's still walking. So as long as he keeps the, keeps that eye and starts to walk, the hits will come if he keeps swinging. Yeah. And there's a team that doesn't, that that they do a pretty good job of of being a well-balanced team in terms of the walks and strikeouts. They're they're, they're not going to strike out a lot, but they do swing at a lot of pitches and they are able to make a lot of contact. Again, it just makes you wonder how come they're the only team that does this? It's become my favorite. It's becoming my favorite running gag. What's that, Austin? Now, I said right. Yeah. Oh, I, okay. I thought you were gonna say something else, but no. It's become a, a hell of a running gag. Hey, wait a minute. None of this is adding up. I mean, th- these are some of the best uh, plate discipline numbers. You know, I was listening to your podcast. You're talking about the umpires, and the bottom five teams you mentioned were uh, the the teams that did not see an advantage for miss calls by umpires, or, or something to that effect. Uh, is that is that the gist of it, though? Yeah, the gist of it was um, who was not favored, essentially, by um, the umpires. Um, and I forget who the bottom five teams were now. I did so much well, research. I remember the Dodgers, the Astros, the Rays, uh, I think even the Braves. Basically, if these were all playoff teams. They were all winning teams is what I remember. Exactly. But the other thing about it, but you also mentioned that it's such a minute part of the game because for the most part it's a high number of calls that these umpires get correctly anyway so when i heard that the playoff teams were struggling quote unquote in getting the unfavored uh judgment calls from these umpires it wasn't surprising that it was all the good teams and because all those good teams what they all have in common is that collectively they have a good batting eye they make enough contact they don't strike out too much they, they could take pitches. They know the walk. A lot of these players on those teams, they know the strike zone like just as well as an umpire does. So I wasn't surprised. And then on the other side of the spectrum, the ones who were supposedly taking it, uh, given the advantages for these missed calls by the umpires, the Colorado Rockies, well, Sean and I, we just, and I think you were a part of that conversation too. We just talked about how the Colorado Rockies for the last 10 years or so was one of the more happy, swinging, free swinging team uh, in the last 10 years. And for good measure, because they play in Colorado. Right. Then, I mean, it's a hitter friendly paradise, probably the most hitter friendly ballpark of all time. Would you agree with that statement? Oh, I would wholeheartedly agree with that statement. <laughs> so, of course, they take advantage. And I think it's more the fact that they swing at so many pitches and they don't really see a lot of, uh, um, I don't know, a lot of deep counts that they are able to kind of get away with that stuff. And, uh, and when I say umpire judgment, and I think you've mentioned this as well, Austin. You're talking about the strike zone, uh, the things that happen behind the plate. Is that correct? Yeah. So all of the numbers that I presented on the podcast were for the home plate umpires. And uh, the other teams were just bad. I think the Phillies were mentioned there too. So that was... Yeah. So I, I pulled up the spreadsheet one more uh, time. Um, in terms of uh, who was most favored, according to the statistics, the top five teams are the Texas Rangers, <laughs> the Cincinnati Reds, <laughs> Oakland, Minnesota, and Milwaukee are the top five. Okay. So a couple of uh, well, the Brewers were the playoff team, but their hitting was so atrocious. That it probably didn't exactly. matter. Exactly. They were either bad teams or bad offenses. Did you mention the Phillies? The Phillies are just out of that. So the top, the, the, the top 10 past fifth, which was Milwaukee. Sixth is the Angels. Uh, seventh was the Red Sox, which playoff team. But yeah. eight, uh, uh, yeah, eighth was the Phillies. Ninth was the Nationals, and then tenth was the Rockies. Oh, okay. I thought I, I thought the Rockies were a top five team. Okay, so I stand corrected. But yeah, a lot, a lot of bad teams in that in that grouping. And then we mentioned the at least the, the teams that I remember. You know, the Rays. I think the Braves, the Dodgers, the Astros. I mean, yeah. <laughs> you're talking about the more disciplined teams in all of baseball, and who have a wonderful approach, wonderful batting eye as a collective group. So what didn't surprise me. So uh, at bottom all. 10, I'll just list the bottom 10, the bottom 10 going from the higher, the higher ones on the list all the way down to the worst is the Dodgers. Then, then the Jays, then the Braves, then the pirates. Um, and ten, uh, those were, they were all tied at the same metric. So they were favored by negative 0.04 runs. So they it really over the span of the whole regular season, the, um, the, uh, home plate umpires tend to favor the visiting team 
um, when it's in these games. And then you have after Pittsburgh, you have the Rays Mm -hmm. and then the Giants, then the White Sox. Houston is third to is third to the bottom. Then you have the Orioles. And then the last one is uh, Detroit. (laughs) The Orioles and Detroit. Well, that makes sense. But but again, you mentioned uh, it's such a small portion of this whole game of ours especially with the umpires, right? Is that what I gathered from you? Yeah. I mean, really, that, that was my whole thing was, you know, my my argument was, do we really need, is there really a necessity with, for robo umpires? Like, is, is it so bad that we need to have robots step in and do this? And really, when you look at all of the numbers for the 2021 regular season, there's really not that much of a spread. And, there's, and, you, and all of the umpires are above, 92% accuracy and they're all above 94, 95% consistency. So, you know, when you think about it in terms of how difficult, when you step back and you take, and you take into consideration how difficult and home plate umpires job truly is, yeah. they're doing it. They're doing a really, really good job. There really is no sense in having the robo umps because with all of the problems that these robo umps are having with reading the breaking ball and stuff like that, they're going to have just the same amount of accuracy as mm-hmm. these human umpires. Yeah. The only one reason I would want robot umpires is if they can, without a, without the, uh, a reasonable doubt or without any, you know, question, they do a much better job than humans. But I, I, I've been hearing the same thing you've been hearing. Uh, it, it, it's either, you know, in progress and it's, decent and it's pretty good or it's really really bad so until i hear that they are way past that point that they are much better than a human umpire then i don't think we're ready for it just yet but yeah if it turns out that they are at 99.9999999% of the ai gets these calls correctly then i'm all for that but until that day comes you know what it is austin every single year everybody complains about umpiring and someone does an audit about the umpires and you know across all sports the nba uh, the NFL, even hockey, when they audit these guys, these these officials, it turns out yeah. that they're doing a pretty damn good job at their job. Yeah, I mean, it's a fabric of sports. I mean, it's it's a fabric of all sports. Everybody's going to complain about the umpire, and everybody's going to say, or the ref, and everybody's going, everybody's saying that the umpire or the ref is terrible. But you know, you're looking at a couple bad calls when you look at over the span of you know over the span of the whole game or the whole season, you know, these, these guys, they, I mean, I, I know for um, MLB umpires anyway, these guys went to school to yeah. learn how to umpire. Yeah. So these are the best of the best of the people that went to school to learn how to do this. So they know what they're doing behind the plate. I mean, even Joe West and Angel Hernandez, yep. they all, all of that, you know, Angel Hernandez was not the worst umpire. Was he one of the best? No, but he was in the middle you know what I mean? So he he's he's not, the the umpires that we know for sucking and being terrible are not even the worst umpires. They just get right? the most uh, airtime, or they get the most highlights, or they get yeah. the worst reputation. It's uh, the whole Salvador Perez thing all over again, where yeah. Perez is uh, deemed as a a guy with a very good reputation for being a very good defensive catcher, and then when Sean and I look at the numbers over the last uh, decade or so, turns out Perez has been on the decline for like the last six or seven years in terms of being a backstop. So I think it's, uh, you know, it's a perception always kind of wins out right? Uh, and reputation takes over, but you, 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 and your podcast, you broke it down by the numbers and maybe people are just uh, prone to overreact and not just in baseball, but across all the sports, basketball's probably the worst. And now we're seeing that we're seeing, I just saw a statistic in basketball in the NBA right now that they're seeing the least amount of free throws that they've seen in, in a very long time. And that's because the NBA told the officials, yeah, let's 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 tone it down with the ticky tacky stuff with the fouls, because for a long time, as you may or may not know, Austin, that was the thing was to, you know, uh, boost the offenses, make sure that these uh, talented players are protected. And then when they get sneezed on that, they get a chance to go to the free throw line so they can boost their statistics, their numbers, the points go up, uh, the pace of play looks higher. And then what happened when the Team USA went to uh, the, to play in the Olympics? All the stuff that these superstar NBA players got used to being called on at, at in the U.S., they realized that they don't call that stuff in international basketball. So there was a massive adjustment to be made there, and ultimately they won the gold medal. But I think the NBA did a good job of uh, kind of um, uh, allowing the officials to 
not blow the whistle every single time there was uh, physical contact with these players. So exactly. And I mean, going, going back to the end, uh, it, it really in any sports, when you're looking at the ref or the umpire or whatever, I mean, obviously you want your team to win. So if a call doesn't go your team's way, a lot of fans, you know, if there's a couple bad calls immediately, the fan goes to, well, they're against my team because that's yeah. just how we as fans want to think about that. Right. And so automatic, and then you have that imprinted in your brain as to, well, this ump is against my team. So, you know, this is now you're looking for the bad calls. You're not looking for the good, for the good calls anymore. You're yeah. looking for the bad ones. And that's basically what we're doing right now as, as baseball fan base is we're looking for the bad calls and we we really uh put the bad calls on a perspective when really you know some of these other guys the trip gibsons and all of the and all these people of the world we don't know who they are because they don't make any bad call or they don't make very many bad calls yeah you know so i i think that's more of what it is is we're highlighting a bunch of bad calls but mm -hmm. when you look at the expanse of an entire season or even a, a game it's because we, you know, it, it's, it's really the opposite. I mean, mm -hmm. I've posted some of the, some of the statistics in regular in just one game and you're like, yeah, they made some bad calls, but when you look at it, the game was actually called pretty good. Right. Right. You know, so no, nah, and it's just the prone for fans to always complain about stuff. So yeah, I, I definitely agree. Thank you for sharing that information. Uh, the one thing I don't agree with you is that it's a form of entertainment, bro. I'm not there to see an umpire blow a freaking call or to see managers make jackasses of themselves. They're not, I'm there to see Joey Votto and Bryce Harper smash. I'm not there to see umpires blowing calls and not, and, and telling me about the you, human. You mean to tell story. me that Lou Pinella yelling oh. at all of those umpires was nope. not fun to watch. You mean to tell nope. me that Lloyd McClendon taking no, that. No, it's. Because it's threw it so in. It was not entertaining. It's so stupid. <laughs> it's not entertaining. Not for me. Like it's a sideshow. It, it's a, it's a show, but it doesn't mean it's a good show. It's not. It brings heat, but it go. It's more like go away heat. Like my friend Kevin would say about wrestling uh, performers, certain <laughs> ones at least. No, I I at the end it just became a joke. Like that, and this is a guy. Uh, Lou Pinella is supposed to be a guy with some respect to the game. Lots of wins under his belt, among other things. Lots of things over his belt, too. <laughs> uh, but uh, no, man, Pinello is supposed to come here and bring some respect to the Cubs. Uh, and, and, you know, he did. I mean, they won divisions in the late 2000s. But you know what? He didn't bring the most important thing was that championship. And, you know, the worst one is when the, ump uh, the managers go out and argue with the umpires about something that was decided upon replay. Like, bro, video evidence showed that the call was either wrong or right beyond a reasonable doubt, sit your ass back down. No, now, I'm going to go out there and argue because I'm going to put a show and make, and you know, I'm going to pretend that this is going to be some, only in baseball. Does this happen in other sports, maybe in basketball, maybe, but in other sports, they, they have their discussion, the officials, the refs and the coaches. And only in baseball do we want to like root for the manager to get ejected. No other sport does this. No other now, sport that, does this, which is the really replay dumb. thing. I agree with if the manager is coming out there after a replay and is arguing with it, that's dumb because now it's definitive. Yes or no. But beforehand, you know, the time of Lou Pinella and Bobby Cox and all of those guys, when they didn't have the replay, they went out there and they were defending their team. And I mean, how, yes, baseball, it's a form of entertainment in the baseball fandom. You know what I mean? And now, and hashtag, it's just hashtag. like I was saying on my podcast. Yeah. Would you rather have Lou Pinella screaming at a box or would you rather have him screaming at a human umpire? I'd rather have him screaming at a human umpire. Well, if he's gonna know, do it. it might be more entertaining if he just screams at a, at a, at a, at a robot umpire because <laughs> it just, it's, it'd be more foolish. Just when you didn't think it could get even more dumb or more foolish than him coming out and arguing with, with, with a, a live person. He's actually arguing with a sentient being, or is that even the right term? Just an artificial being, I guess, is the better term for that. Make a jacket of yourself. Fine. Be that way. I don't care. <laughs> get, get, sit your ass down. Go back to the dugout. Take a shower. Let's get back to the game. But and let's get back to the series. So yep. uh, check out uh, Austin's podcast. That's his most recent episode where he talks about umpiring. He does have experience being an umpire himself. Just the, what, how old were you, 12 years old, when you were umpiring Little League? I was. So I don't know if I still am, but I was one of the youngest people to umpire an all-star game. I umpired a, uh, they were nine and 10 year olds. I umpired that, that uh, an all-star game at 12 years old. 
And then uh, you said that you got parents attacking you, right? Yeah, um, it's 40 year old men don't take too well to uh, a 12 year old throwing them out or even being behind the plate calling balls and strikes. Yep. Um, and then, you know, I had a pretty consistent strike zone. And, but I mean, it's Little League and, and I'm 12. Like, <laughs> I'm not going to be perfect. And yeah, you would have 40 year old men get upset at my strike zone. And I would tell them, if you don't shut your mouth, I'm going to, I'm going to throw you out. They didn't shut their mouth. So I threw them out. Like, hey man, adults in general, adults in general are just like that. I mean, I, I think I, you might've seen the story where my, my child was entered into a cutest costume contest. Uh, I, I did. I did see that post. Yeah. And you saw the post where this other adult from the, another family goes, Psh, our baby was a lot cuter than whatever the fuck that skunk was doing. Yeah. I'm like, so yeah, that's the equivalent that I experienced this past weekend. So adults in general, they, uh, they need to uh, lead the way in terms of maturity before they start judging. What was that whole thing I said before? Throwing rocks at people's businesses or whatever? I don't know. <laughs> uh, really quick, uh, Jose Altuve, I mentioned that the two that the three hits he hit, two of them were ginormous. Uh, the top 10 plays in this series, according to baseball reference, Jose Altuve got the number two most important play of the series and the number four most important play of the series, both home runs. One against Tanner Hoek in game one. The other one against Garrett Whitlock in game four. So he's doing it against the Red Sox best pitchers, some of their best pitchers uh, to come out of the pen. And he delivered. I mean, he wasn't there the entire series, but he delivered. So on the opposite side of the spectrum, let's take a look at some of the worst performers uh, of this series, starting with Kyle Tucker at negative 0.45. But didn't he hit the, the big home run in game six? Right. That, like I was really shocked to see this, especially since he's hitting 261 with a 320 on base and he's at a negative 0.45. Like how many like pivotal situations did he have to get put in and fail in order to get to a negative 0.45 at a 261 batting average? Or maybe there was nothing for him to fail at because there was nobody on base for him to uh, maybe. improve that number. But yeah, he he had a pretty decent series. I mean, he hit to he two home runs. Two home run, eight RBI. So I was looking at the on base percentage, which is only 320. So, um, but no, overall, 885 ops on base plus slugging. But you're right, he delivered. And again, this is why I don't like using WPA to judge season performance. But if it's game to game like this, it's, it uh, makes for an interesting outlook on these individual games. Alex Bregman, the other one, zero, uh, negative 0 0.23, only hitting 217. 308 on base percentage. You think he bounces back in the World Series there? Oh, uh, it's tough because I thought he'd bounce back in the in the championship series. Um, I don't know. The Braves pitching staff is a little shaky. Um, but they 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 know how to put it together. Yeah. So I think out of the two, Tucker and Bregman, I feel like Bregman is gonna be the one that doesn't figure it out. Uh, moving on, Martin Maldonado, but he's a catcher. They they can't hit, but he, I guess he did a pretty good job behind the plate, right? I'll tell you what, what a throw. That throw, yeah. that throw down, that was, yeah. I'm sorry, that was sexy. Like, as a <laughs> former catcher, like, Dude. I saw that, and I was like, oh, my God. Like, I had to watch that a ton. of. I mean, that was right on the money, right where it was supposed to be. Uh Correa's glove didn't even move. It was right. It led him right into the runner. That was a beautiful throw. I don't care what these statistics say. He came up big with that throwdown. That throwdown was sweet. I love watching plays like that. Yeah. I mean, I thought he did a good job behind the plate. I mean, he must have. He, he, uh, I mean, the fact that I think Luis Garcia was the one who pitched in game six having that no hitter through five innings or whatever that was. Yeah, I believe so. And Martin Maldonado was behind the plate, I'm assuming. Uh, yeah, well, yeah, he played six games, so he sh he he should be, yeah. The Jason Castro appearance is really throwing me off. That's why I'm asking. Uh, now I'm doubting myself here, but uh, I mean, uh, he, he was probably in pinched hit in the late innings for Maldonado or the yeah. yeah I mean, le left-handed bat for sure. Who can left-handed power bat? I guess. Yeah. Uh, so the point is, Maldonado not just could throw the ball, but he must have done a hell of a job uh, calming some of these pitchers down, some of these young, unproven pitchers like Luis Garcia down and uh, bringing out the best of them. So uh, very Yadier Molina-like, I guess. Uh, and then uh, Chaz McCormick, uh, that's the last play I want to talk about here. Uh, not really, but yeah, he struck out six times. He had a miserable series, but he was being talked about with high praise uh, in the broadcast. I don't know why, but there he is. But th this is the guy that pretty much replaced Miles Straw 
So who knows how much better this uh, Astros offense would be with Miles Straw. Let's go over to the Red Sox. And the only player that's worth of uh, noting in these ALCS was J.D. Martinez, who uh, had a WPA of 0.43. Yeah, he he was really the only one that showed up. He had five walks, uh, two homers. They were two big homers. Um, that was half of the hits that he had. Um, but, I mean – it's really weird. He has a 0.43 because he has nine strikeouts. The only other person in this series that struck out more than JD Martinez is his teammate Xander Bogarts. Oof. So, I mean, nine strikeouts in six games. That's a lot. That's a ton of strikeouts. So, I mean, when you, when your most, I guess you want to call it clutch, your, your, per, your guy that came in the came in and delivered when he needed to the most is striking out nine times. You're going to have a tough time against the Astros. Yeah. Well, the big play for him was that he hit, uh, let's see, he hit the grand slam of Luis Garcia in game two. Yeah. So that was the third best, uh, the third most important play of this series. So that's why his numbers way up high, despite the strikeouts. I mean, he still had a very good series, uh, 435 on base percentage one zero. Let me repeat that 1.082 ops. So, I mean, he was probably the most dangerous hitter in this lineup, along with Rafael Devers. But J.D. Martinez, according to WPA, was the one who showed up big in this series. Other guy on the positive side was Enrique Quique Hernandez, who had himself a hell of a, a playoff to remember this season. Uh, pretty decent uh, ALCS with the three home runs, the three RBI, the 1.254 ops, but only the 0.04 WPA. Uh, anything you have? you have anything to add to uh, Enrique Hernandez being the number two Red Sox here? I mean, go Kike. Like, I really was – I loved watching Kike this series. Um, he he got on base. That's what he was supposed to do for his team was get on base. 385 batting average, 407 OBP. You can't do much more than that. You know, he did what he was supposed to do. He had he had a great series. I'm not going to – I'm not going to hold the 0.04 WPA. By, he had – one heck of a series. In fact, I would, I think, in my opinion, he had a better series than JD Martinez. I think he had probably the best series out of almost every hitter. I think the only one that you could probably say challenges and probably had a better one is Jordan Alvarez. After that, I really think after that, it's Kike that had the, that had a, the best series. So, so you were complete. You were complaining about the nine strikeouts with J.D. Martinez. I mean, he did walk five times, so it's not as bad yeah. as. Uh, and, and and on the opposite side of the spectrum, you mentioned Xander Borgarts. He struck out ten times, but he only walked twice, so that's a problem there. Uh, Kike looks like he had three solo home runs, so maybe that's why his WPA is so low. I'm assuming. Yeah, yeah maybe, probably. Um, if he had people on base, but there again, he was at the top of the lineup. And we've mm. talked about it before, either yeah. on my podcast or on yours. You know, these top of the lineup contact hitting guys, they, you know, or th these top of the lineup guys, they get penalized in, in terms of WPA because they're at the top of the lineup. They don't hit as many guys in because there aren't as many people on base. That is true. That is very true. All right, let's go quickly to the other side of the spectrum here. Hunter Renfro at negative 0 0.18. He had a miserable series. Kyle Schwarber. Oh, my goodness. This is... Uh... On the negative side, Travis Shaw, but he was a part-time player. Alex Verdugo, who walked five times, only struck out once, which if, if you know who Alex Verdugo is and what his plate approach is, that shouldn't surprise you. Still, uh, I mean, he – oh, sorry, I was looking at the wrong thing. I mean, he got on base, obviously, with the big walks, uh, the, the, the high number of walks. He did get on base at a, four, at a 417 on base percentage, but negative 0 0.11 WPA. Same thing with Rafael Devers, who also had a pretty good series in terms of the traditional slash line numbers. He also hit three home runs, six RBI, uh, did a good job of controlling the strikeouts, but still, uh, I guess there was not enough players on base for him to make an impact with that power he was displaying in this series. Uh, Xander Bogart, we just mentioned, he did hit a big home run in the series as well, but it was not enough. He only hit a dollar ninety two in this one. So that's a problem. Yes, it is. That's and, really rough in terms of, I mean, Xander Bogarts along with Devers is a big part of this, of this offense. And Devers did a really good job. I don't think the negative WPA is indicative of the season that he, of the series he had, but Xander Bogarts, it is indicative of the series that he had he, or uh, the championship series. Anyway, he had, he just did not have a good championship series. 
Or I mean, Bogarts, I'm sorry. Yeah, Bogarts, yeah. It's just a shame because he's one of the more important players on that team. And yeah, Yeah. he's not showing up, then you're screwed. Uh, Let's take a quick look at the pitching. Number one in the hood, G. Kendall Graveman with the big acquisition from the Seattle Mariners. Uh, So maybe the Mariners fans who were crying about Kendall Graveman getting traded, maybe they were right. They shouldn't have done it. Maybe it was. Maybe it could be the Mariners in this position. We'll never know now. But uh, let's see what the raw numbers say. Five strikeouts and four innings pitch, a one zero 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 whip. So he he definitely paid off dividends. Also on the list is Christian Javier. Uh, oh, okay. So he, he was coming out of the bullpen. I thought I must have been dreaming of him coming out as a starter one of these games, but I guess not. Uh, seven strikeouts and five innings pitch, also with a one whip, uh, and he had the second highest WP. Phil Matan, another key acquisition. I believe this one. I think that he's part of the mile straw deal. So maybe yes. it was worth it. Maybe it was. I mean, they needed they needed some bullpen arms. They and Maton came in and delivered in the championship series and uh, helped send them to the World Series. So and it's a bunch of bullpen guys, Brooks Raley, Ryan Stenek. I mean, the bullpen showed up big in this one. I mean, it would have explained why the Red Sox bats just kind of went silent near the end. Uh, we finally get to a starter in Fran Barrow Valdez. He got 10 innings pitch, only seven strikeouts, four walks, nine hits. Uh, three earned runs, four runs allowed, but he ends up on the positive side of WPA with a one and all record. Ryan Presley, he shows up on the positive side a lot. The pitchers came up big, so I can go on forever. Let's take a quick look at the pitchers who didn't show up, starting with Jose Urquidy at negative 0.33, 4.20 whip, five earned runs. Just an awful, awful, awful uh, start for him. One and two thirds inning, followed by Zach Granke, who did not start. Oh, he did start. Okay, remember, because I think. We saw him, his name on the bullpen. Um, yeah. And then Jake Odorizzi, who was also awful in his, uh, oh, I thought he was starting too, but yeah, in his uh, one relief appearance. Of those three pitchers, who do you want to focus on today? Uh, I, I, I want to talk about Zach Greinke just because Zach Greinke has been so great in the playoffs and in his entire career. Um, and I heard something in the broadcast that I never thought I'd hear, I never thought I'd hear when referring to Zach Greinke and the broadcasters are saying that the Astros want to stay away from Zach Greinke in the championship series. And I was like, that is not something I would have ever thought that any broadcaster would have ever said when referring to Zach Greinke, even though he's grunting as loud as he can and throwing 87 mile an hour fastballs, you know, Zach, Zach Greinke knows how to pitch. And I mean, obviously they wanted to stay away from him. He had one in the third inning, one game, one start, that was all Dusty Baker needed apparently to be, to be like, go, go sit in the bullpen and watch everybody else pitch Zach. Cause uh, I'm not, I'm not going back to you. So I'm really interested to see if Dusty Baker goes back to Zach Greinke in the world series. Mm-hmm. Um, especially since Zach Greinke really has, you know, he has a lot of playoff experience and he, yeah. he you know, he's been a part of the pitching staff for the Astros for a, a long time. He's been a part of all three of those teams that went to work that went to the world series. Right. So it'll be really interesting to see if he goes back to Granky and how much he goes back to Granky in the world series. Well, if we know the Astros, we know that they're going to try to their best to put him in a spot where he can succeed or probably in a spot where he's just going to be relied on mop up duty. So we'll see. Should be an interesting one. Uh, to the Red Sox pitching, uh, Nick Pavetta, his one start, he did pretty well for himself. So it's same thing with Eduardo Rodriguez and his one start, uh, seven strikeouts and six innings pitch. So can't blame it on those guys. Even Adam Adovino, who gave up the big home run at the, in, in game six, he still stood up on the positive side uh, Yeah, in four games. Uh-huh. And Josh Taylor, Garrett Whitlock, we already talked about Garrett Whitlock. So of those uh, five pitchers that I spoke about right now, is there one in particular that you want to speak to on this? Um, I think I think we've talked about Garrett Whit- Garrett Whitlock enough. Um, I Adam Montevito, I guess. Um, Adam Montevito, he for me anyway, he's a wild card. You never know what kind of a- Adam Montevito you're going to get. You're either yeah. going to get the lights out Adam Montevito, or you're going to get the Adam Montevito that just gets lit up. Right. Um, and they relied on him heavily. For he pitched in four out of the four out of the six games and he came in, came in big. Um, and Eduardo Rodriguez, one start and he's been kind of shaky throughout the season was good. Then wasn't, then was good. Then was okay. So it was, I was really interested to see how he performed one start, seven strikeouts. I mean, three runs. He kept his team in the ball game. That's all I can ask for as a manager. Yeah. 
Uh, the opposite side of the spectrum, uh, there's a lot of blame to go around. We just mentioned Tanner Hoek uh, giving up the big home run to Jose Altuve. Yep, there it is. Negative 0.20. Nathan Ovaldi, who was their most important player, starting pitcher uh, for the for most of the playoffs. I mean, he outdueled the uh, uh, the Yankee starter. I'm, I'm, he outdueled Garrett Cole. Yeah, thank you, Garrett. He outdueled Garrett Cole, which that was the complete opposite of what I thought was going to happen in that, in that wild card game. Not me. Okay. Hans. Yeah. Let's like, let's take a look at the rest <laughs> of your predictions. It's nothing but blackness, just the black hole of wrong answers. Yeah. But ah! let's, look at, let's look at everybody's everybody's almost hey. everybody's is nothing but blackness. Hey, so I, I was pretty close though. I you were, the, you were the best out of close. everybody, but there's still quite a few black on yours. I know I'm the best. <laughs> <laughs> uh Hansel Robles three games uh that going in and I, I'm pretty sure Austin is pretty giddy to see Hansel Robles kind of have pie in his face in the series yeah yeah good riddance Hansel Robles um you know it doesn't surprise me that Hansel Robles didn't didn't come in the clutch as as former angel I was hoping he'd find it again but he he was good for the angels one year and then really just laid an egg and just pooped all over himself and it's yeah. just it's terrible so i wasn't surprised that hansel robles didn't show up for the postseason i'm really surprised that they put him on the postseason postseason roster to be honest because i really don't see any sort of sample size where you think that hansel robles is going to be an important part of the of the bullpen well, so, speaking of which, uh, Martin Perez, uh, I was surprised to see his name every time I, I'm pretty sure that every time the Astros saw his, him come out, they were just like, Oh yeah. I can't wait to see this guy. Right. Uh, in four games, he posted a 12 ERA with a 3.333 whip. Uh, and it could have been a lot worse in terms of WPA, but I guess, uh, it must have not been that big of damage, but yeah, four earned runs and only three innings pitch, just a disaster, no strikeouts. So ugh, where do you go from? Where do you go from here if you're Martin Perez? Well, that's to be answered at a different podcast. And to round things off, Hiro, Hirokazu, Sawamura, Ryan Brazier, Chris Sale, all on the negative side. Uh, I guess that's pretty much it, man. I mean, you already mentioned Hansel Robles. We talked about Nathan Ovali uh, being a very important player. Unfortunately, that's not how he's going to be re remembered in terms of the record books. He's on the negative side of things. So let's quickly move on to the Braves and the Dodgers. Uh, see how fast I can get these names out. Uh, obviously, the most important player for the Braves was Eddie Rosario. Followed uh, with a, we're seeing a WPA over one. Austin, I I didn't think we were going to see that. In I didn't think series. so either. It's such a small sample size. You knew he, you know, he's really important when in six games he posts a WPA over one. All the rest of these we've been seeing is like point zero five, point two point whatever and now yeah. for over one he came in the clutch every time he went up there every time i saw him every time he was out the plate he was hitting a home run or extra base hit yeah uh it, it was quite amazing i mean and then he ends up winning the uh, nlcs mvp correct he did rightfully so maybe there's something to this number after all maybe there is some, maybe we should take the stat a little bit more serious so i, I mean uh, maybe maybe that's what uh <laughs> that's what these voters are are looking at is wpa <laughs> It, it each MVP M, each MVP winner was the team leader in WPA. WPA. Yeah. Oh my God. Eddie Rosario is number one and number two in the top ten plays of this series. <laughs> that doesn't surprise me. I mean, he had three homers, nine RBIs, three important walks. He had a double. He had a triple. I mean, fourteen hits in twenty five at bats in the series. His slash line five sixty six oh seven with a 1040 slugging and a 1647 OPS. The dude crushed the ball. Oh, yeah. Well, here's the first example. Game two, bottom of the ninth, tied at four with two outs, uh, runner on second, first pitch he sees, single to the shortstop side. Uh, and then he was able to score Dansby Swanson. And this is off Kenley Jansen, by the way. Yep. And then the other big moment in the series, game six, bottom of the fourth, tight at one. So it, bottom of the fourth, right? doesn't have to be the bottom of the seventh or the bottom of the eighth or the bottom of the ninth. It's like we talked about, you know, a, a run early in the game is just as important as a run late in the game. Exactly. Well, in this instance, he, Eddie Rosario hit the big home run off of Walker Bueller to deep right field. And that scored three runs, a three-run home run. So that's it. Number one, number two in the series. Eddie Rosario, your MVP winner. 
Uh, I mentioned Austin Riley. Uh, the raw stats didn't show that, but the WPA shows a player who was at positive 0.65. And of course, his big play came in game two, bottom of the eighth. The Braves down 4 3. He's, he hits, uh, what the hell did he do? A double off of Julio Urias. And uh, yeah, th- th- these Braves were just a, a thorn on some of these pitchers' sides. And that's it. Oh, uh, Jock Peterson, who literally was wearing pearls. He shows up with a minute 0.04 WPA, but his hit was important enough to put the Braves over the top. And that occurred in game two as well. Bottom of the fourth, the Braves down to nothing. He hits a game time home run off. Max Scherzer, who we talked about this, uh, Austin, or I think, I think you talked about it. Well, we talked about it in privately, and then you use that information for your own podcast. <laughs> Max Scherzer was tired, fatigued, exhausted. So, yep. um, so anything so else? I, you, oh, go ahead. I'm sorry. I've got a question for you. So let's go back to Austin Riley and his 0.65 WPA. So here's the thing. His biggest play is off of is his double off of Julio Arias was a walk-off, right? So my question is, do you think that WPA takes what pitcher is on the mound in consideration? No, because it does it doesn't? No, because it if is. if Julio Urias succeeds in that point, then Julio then Julio Urias gets the uh, whatever the WPA is or whatever version uh, these pitchers get um, added my, to their my thought, WPA. My thoughts were like, let's say it's not Julio Urias. Let's say it was, I don't know. Let's say it was. Vesia on the mound, right? Yeah. And, you know, although Vesia did come in the clutch for um, his team, we'll get to him in a minute. Um, let's just say it's Vesia, someone who is not necessarily as known as Julio Rios to come in the playoffs. Yeah. Does the win expectancy change because of the pitcher that's on the mound? I don't think so. I think what happens here is, is that the situation is the, the, the situation off of Rios is the bottom of the eighth. Riley and the Braves are down 4-3. There's a runner on base, only one out. And, uh, yeah, he hits a double to tie the game. I mean, that's a big clutch hit, regardless of who's out there. Now, if you want to, you know, create your own stat where you also account for pitching talent on the mound at the point of attack, then you go ahead and do the gory math. You are a math teacher. If anybody can do it, it'd be you. But, uh, I, no, I think this is just situation-based. This is why, I mean, if you're into that sort of stuff, this is why WPA doesn't work to gauge uh, performance overall because it only cares about the situation. It's a storytelling t- stat. And uh, I messed up. I uh, Game one as well, Austin Riley comes up big against Blake Trinan, who's also a pretty damn good pitcher. Tied at two in the bottom of the ninth. He hits a single to left field, and uh, he scores Ozzy Alves. Uh, to get game one. So, I mean, the Braves were just, and, and you look at the WPA, it wasn't a lot of, it, it wasn't like everybody, you know, going, coming through the clutch every single time. It was just the same guys. It was Eddie Rosario putting that team on his back with the help of Austin Riley and Jock Peterson's pearls. So on the opposite side, the negative side, you got Dansby Swanson at negative 0.32. Ozzy Alvey is at negative 0.1.4. Uh, Ehiri Adrianza, uh, we're not going to mention the pitchers, but Johan Camargo showed up uh, in pinch hitting duty, it looks like. Orlando Garcia, there's a guy again. We mentioned him in the previous podcast. Freddie Freeman being the big name on the bottom side of things. Uh, negative zero, negative zero point zero five, despite the fact that he had a hell of a series hitting uh, an ops of 1.063 with the two home runs, four RBI, six walks, eight strikeouts. So the raw stats love Freddie Freeman. If if there was an if an MVP were to be uh, given, well, let me rephrase that. If Eddie Rosario wasn't on this team, I guess the raw numbers would support Freddie Freeman. But because he probably was doing this with nobody on base or not a lot of players on base or or in situations that didn't call for a big hit from him, he gets penalized for that too. So, uh, anybody you want to talk about on the negative side of things with the Braves here? So, I mean, I was I was wanting to talk about uh, Freddie Freeman. Um, I'm not surprised that Dansby Swanson's down here. And really, in postseason, when it's a game of matchups, I'm mm. not really surprised that Ozzy Albies being down here either because mm. they're playing Ozzy Albies. I mean, every it was very obvious that Ozzy – we all know that Ozzy Albies is a better – right is a markedly better right-handed hitter than he is a left-handed hitter. Yep. So – They put pitchers on the mound for Albies. You know, they played that matchup. They put pitchers on there that would make Albies go to the left, to the left-handed batter's box. 
So I'm not surprised to see all these down there. Um, I am, you know, Fred Freeman did have a great series or he had a better series, I should say, than his dismal uh, uh, division series there, but he still struck out eight times. And I think, you know, all, although he had six walks, I think what's penalizing him here is much um, is to the fact that he's in the middle of the lineup. Yeah. Right. It, the fact that he's in the middle of the lineup and Eddie Rosario and Austin Riley and these guys were getting on base. The fact that he had a number of people on base and was not producing as you know, in as many situations. Yeah. It's going to, it's going to be negative because he's seeing more situations where it could change the fabric of the, it could change the win expectancy of the game. Let's see here. Um, I'm just gasping because uh, it's getting to that point of the show here. So quickly to the Dodgers. The Dodgers, Chris Taylor shows up big here. Three home runs, nine RBI, WPA of 0.84. If the Dodgers pull this victory off, I think Chris Taylor is in pretty good shape to get the NLCS MVP. And he's, yeah. fo- and he's followed by Cody Bellinger, who's at positive 0.44. He kind of found his batting stroke. It wasn't just an NLDS thing, but an, also an, an NLCS thing as well with him. And then you got uh, on the lesser side of things, AJ Pollock. And we don't like to talk about pitchers who hit. So uh, anything else you want to add about any of those three guys that I just mentioned? Chris Taylor, Cody Bellinger, AJ Pollock. Well, I think one thing that's very interesting with these guys is when you look at all the other top um, WPA guys, and I'm sure, and I think this stat does contribute minutely to WPA, but Chris Taylor and Cody Bellinger combined for five stolen bases in two games or in, in six games, right? Yeah. The Dodgers all together combined for 11 stolen bases in six games against the Braves. And they they were lost. running <laughs> and they still lost, but I mean, they were running. So it's very interesting to see the top two in in um, WPA were among some of those that stole bases. Now you have Mookie Betts, who's at a negative 0.09 and had four stolen bases in the series. But it's just really interesting to see how really they had, both Chris Taylor and Cody Bellinger had a good series. But on top of that, they also stole some bags. Yeah, usually stolen bases is not indicative of uh, if a team can win or not. Usually that goes to on-base percentage, at least depending on the, uh, the 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 baseball writer you're reading about. But usually on-base percentage, usually the safe side. But in this instance, the Dodgers uh, beat the Braves in on-base percentage, 330 versus uh, 321. And the Dodgers still lost. So they can't win with stolen bases. They can't win with on-base percentage. And it was the Braves who uh, continue to get the big hits time and time again. So uh, on the negative side of things, you mentioned Mookie Betts. He was at negative 0.09. He had a miserable series regardless. He did steal a four bases, but he was awful. Uh, yes, $1.74 on uh, batting average, 296 on base percentage. So not good. Trey Turner, uh, the big acquisition from the Nationals. Nowhere to be found. Struck out seven times against only one walk. Uh, 240 batting average, 296 on base percentage, and the worst player, according to uh, WPA, Steven Souza Jr., who I thought he was done, uh, is the second to worst WPA person here. Negative 0.21. Albert Pujols, <laughs> also on the negative side. Corey Seager, Justin Turner, Gavin Lux, Matt Beatty. Oh, boy. So, I mean, we, we, that's, those are some big names there, uh, Austin. Huh? Those are some big names who did not come through for the Dodgers in this it, series. It's very big names, and I think that is the story of this series right here. The two biggest contributors were Chris Taylor and Cody Bellinger, the guys that the Dodgers were really hoping to come through like they did all year long, Trey Turner, Corey Seager, Justin Turner, Mookie Betts, all of those guys, they're all negatives. They all did not, 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 none of them, Will Smith, none of them had great series. They all got two, three, four hits out of 20 something at bats. They did not show up when they needed to, as opposed to the Braves, you know, you had Austin Riley, who was a big part of their offense this year, Mm -hmm. right? He wasn't supposed to be, but he ended up being a big part Mm -hmm. and you know, he, he contributed. And then you had Eddie Rosario come out and just have this blistering good series on top of Jock, Jock Peterson, who also had a great series made up for the fact that 
Freddie Freeman didn't have that good of a series. But even then, when you look at Freddie Freeman, he's still back 286, yep. 444, 619. When you're looking at all the rest of these guys, you know, Trey Turner had a 240. Corey Seager had a uh, 167. Justin Turner, 200 before he got hurt. Mookie Betts, 174. Will Smith, 217. Yep. These guys aren't getting on base. They weren't getting any hits. The Braves outplayed the Dodgers. Yep. Simple as that in terms of the hitter, in terms of the hitting. Let's look, take a look at the pitching really quick. WPA, uh, Tyler Matzek. I mean, <laughs> what a story. And uh, it's just remarkable how he has been able to bounce back and become one of the better uh, relief pitchers in all of baseball, kind of uh, becoming a household name. Speaking of household names, though, we, the other Will Smith, Will Smith, the relief pitcher, who signed that lucrative deal with the Braves a, a year or two ago, he showed up big. Two, it got the two wins and the one save, uh, four strikeouts of four innings pitch, and the second best WPA of the series. AJ Minter, another guy, eight strikeouts, eight big strikeouts, six innings pitch, and uh, 0 0.34 WPA. Drew Smiley, um, not that he started, but he uh, pitched three and a third solid innings for the Braves, only a 0 0.90 whip, uh, and, and he shows up on the positive side. And even we go smaller here, Ian Anderson. Pitched two starts, seven complete innings. Uh, sub, sorry, seven full innings combined, and he didn't look like it. Doesn't look like he had a very good series, but he did enough to keep his team in the game. I guess he right. only gave up the three earned runs in those two starts. Charlie Morton also on the positive side, walked six guys, but I, I don't know. The at least he got five innings in there for the team. Uh, I don't know, Austin, who do you want to talk about on the positive side of things for the Braves pitching? Uh, uh, on the positive side, I want to talk about Tyler Matzik only because in six innings pitched five game, you know, he pitched in five games, six innings. He struck out 11 guys, 11 guys in six innings. So you're looking at, you're looking at two, you're looking at just a, just a little under two strikeouts per inning. So that's, if you figured it out to, you know, K per nine, which I don't particularly care for that stat, especially when it comes to relievers, because it takes relievers forever to get to nine innings pitch. But if you're looking at K per nine, you're looking at almost 18, you're probably looking at 16 Ks per nine, which is a lot, especially coming from a reliever. So good for Tyler Matzik. Great story. What a great, uh, that it was a great series for him. He came out and delivered when he needed to striking out 11 guys and only walked two. So good for him. Yeah. Very remarkable. Had a very good season too, uh, this past year as well. Um, despite the four losses, but you know, who cares about the losses? Yeah. <laughs> he showed up when he had to. Yeah. On the negative side, uh, Luke Jackson, uh, also had a pretty damn good season this year. But did not have a very fun uh, playoff with a 27 ERA after four games. Uh, very awful whip, 5.40, negative one. So that's the other side. Eddie Rosario gets you over one, and Luke Jackson gets you uh, at negative one. So they deserve each other. Jesse Chavez, who uh, I feel like he was being talked about big in this series, also on the I negative. thought so too, which I thought was weird. Like I, of all of the pitchers on the pitching staff to be to talk big about, I wouldn't have talked big about Jesse Chavez. Like I wouldn't have talked terrible about him, but I, he's not yeah. the first one that would have come to mind. Right. Uh, Chris Martin also shows up on the negative side, and Max Fried uh, after two starts, uh, five nine one ERA. Uh, he did strike out eight guys in ten and two thirds innings, but he gave up sixteen hits for a WHIP of one point six nine. So of those four guys I just mentioned, Luke Jackson, Jesse Chavez, Chris Martin, and Max Fried, who did you want to talk about? Luke Jackson. So, yeah. and, and in the context that I want to talk Luke, about Luke Jackson is coming into game six, um, Snickter put in Luke Jackson in what was still kind of an important part of the game. They were making, they were, they had to make sure that the Dodgers weren't going to come back in game in game six and he put Luke Jackson in. And even when you look at the stat, it doesn't matter what stat you look at. I still don't understand why he put Luke Jackson in instead of going straight to Will Smith. Wow. So people were busy complaining about, about Dave Roberts, but maybe they should have been, they could have been complaining about Brian Snitker if uh, things don't fall the Braves way, huh? Yeah, they could have because, and I was talking about it with my cousin who is a Braves fan and he, 
he and I talked about this. We're like, why did he put in Jackson and then Smith? Why didn't he just go straight to Smith? Or why didn't he go to somebody else? I mean, literally, I mean, you look at the stats, he literally could have put pretty much anybody else, uh, maybe besides Jacob Webb, besides anybody else in, in, in that spot, and they would have done better than Luke Jackson. So, I, I mean, it ended up working out. It ended up being okay for the Braves, but Luke Jackson was a really weird choice for me in terms of you know you need to you need to keep the Dodgers down you need to keep them from coming back in game six because if they come back in game six they've got the momentum for game seven yeah you know so you know and who knows what would have happened then so you put in Luke Jackson the guy who has a 27 ERA and at that point three you know three games it, it just didn't make any sense to me so yeah I I don't know but lucky for him it Worked out, and they're going to the World Series. Uh, Luke Jackson also responsible f- for three of uh, – he was a pitcher for three of the top ten plays in the series. And he gave up big hits to Cody Bellinger, Chris Taylor, and A.J. Pollock, who happened to be the Dodgers. Yep, top three in WPA. So the reason that the Dodgers have a top three of positive players in the WPA stat is all because of Luke Jackson. Exactly. So I don't understand why you put him in in that situation, but yep. I'm not I'm not the manager. I'm not in the dugout. So well, let's take a look at uh, Dave Roberts's uh, rotation and bullpen because uh, he was getting a lot of flack. Uh, we obviously agree uh, in our private conversation, and uh, you also mentioned this in your podcast as well that a lot of the big names were the Dodgers were just simply out of gas. They were exhausted. They looked tired. The Max Scherzer complaining about a dead arm which is like whoa buddy that's not a good sign yeah but uh, this list starts out with uh, Alex Vizia who you uh, mentioned very quickly three innings pitch and uh, three walks five strikeouts a big a big whip of two but good enough to have a zero uh, a positive 0.24 WPA uh, followed by Bruce R. Gratterall in uh, four and a third inning he got four strikeouts a very minute whip so second in WPA there, Phil Bickford at number three, Justin Bruel at number four, Evan Phillips at number five, Joe Joe Kelly, who was, uh, I believe he was the game six starter. Is that correct? Or Yes, he did. He did start game six and actually got hurt. Um, so if the Dodgers, if the Dodgers were to go on, they wouldn't have had Joe Kelly. Well, he kept them in the game. Four strikeouts in three innings, only gave up two earned runs. Uh I think that would have been enough to keep the Dodgers in the game. So uh, all those pitchers I just talked about, did you want to discuss someone really quickly here? I was really surprised to see that Bruce Dar- I mean, Bruce Dar- Gr- Gratterall came in, you know, and did what he was supposed to do. But Bruce Dar- Gratterall, I don't know what it is about Gratterall. And I, I, you know what? I think I know what it is. I don't trust Bruce Dar- Gratterall. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think it's because... He throws 102 mile, miles an hour, right? Throws 102, 101 miles an hour, whatever. And if I remember correctly, I don't have his baseball savant page or any of that up, but I believe his whiff percentage is very low. I believe last time I looked, it was like 14, 15%. When you yeah. throw 102 miles an hour and you don't get whiffs, there's something wrong there, right? Yeah. I mean, I get it. It's a sinker, so he's a ground ball pitcher. But ground ball pitchers aren't supposed to throw 102 miles an hour. If you're throwing 102 miles an hour, you better be getting some strikeouts because a lot of these hitters, if they're gonna get, if they're gonna get a hold of 102 miles an hour, it's gonna go a long way. So I, I don't know. I don't trust Bruce Dar Gratterall because if his, if his sinker is not on and his sinker doesn't dip the way it's supposed to and it goes over the middle of the plate, that's 102 miles an hour over the middle of the plate. It's going to get hit hard. So yeah, I don't know. I don't, I don't trust Bruce Dark Granderall, but I mean, some of these numbers are proving me wrong. I mean, he's got a 0.231 whip um, and four and a third innings pitched. He only allowed one earned run on one hit. So, I mean, g- good for him to have a good series. I just don't, I don't trust Granderall at all. I don't know what it is about it. I just don't trust him. Yeah, and that's uh, that's a thing that we can't figure out with him as well. For a guy who throws really hard, and we talked about it on this podcast numerous times this year, very early on in the season, uh, season two of the Total Basis podcast. And there, I know there was a reasoning that Sean gave me, and I can't remember at this point. But yeah, Bruce Hart Gatterall is a is a is an enigma, so to speak, at this point. On the negative side, unfortunately, it uh, it's all the big names for the Dodgers. 
Julio Urias with a negative 0.57, Walker Buehler with a negative 0.55, uh, Blake Trinan, Kenley Jansen, Corey Knable, Tony Gonsolin. Uh, obviously, Tony Gonsolin gave out that big home run in, was it game four or game five? I don't remember. Yeah, it's that a, one I don't. It's all a haze. Max yeah. Scherzer in his one start only pitched four in a third inning, gave up only the two earned runs, got the only gave up a walk, seven strikeouts, a whip of 1.154. But as he would mention in the press conference, he was dead dog tired. Uh, like I mentioned, lots of big names on the negative side of things. Uh, who did you want to focus on on this one? Walker Bueller, only simply because when the Dodgers have needed him in the in the postseason in elimination games, uh, I saw a stat where I believe he was like second or third all time in ERA for um games where the, their team is facing elimination. He, he had like a 0.55 ERA or something like that. And in both of these starts that he had in the seat in the uh, championship series, he got rocked. Like he got hit hard. Some of these, you know, some, some Dodger fans or people I was talking to was saying, Oh, it's because of, you know, it's because of that bad call, which he was on the mound for that bad, um, for that bad one, two. Uh, yeah. It was a one, two call. No, it was a 2 It was on the corner. It was on the corner of the plate, and it ended up being uh, a ball. And it was Jay, uh, or no, maybe I'm thinking of the wrong series. Either way, um, he got rocked um, in both starts. He was getting hit hard, and people were saying, oh, it was the umpire, and it was bad defensive play. I'm like, no, he got hit hard. I don't remember who shared it. I don't know if it was you. I don't know if we had – I think it was you and I had a private conversation where um, – when you look at the game log and, you know, in the first three innings, he had, I think it was seven pitches or seven hits that had an exit velocity of over 95 miles an hour. Nope. Like we're looking at them barreling it up at that point in the first three innings, he got rocked. He got hit hard. Yeah. It's just not, I mean, I had the Dodgers make it to the world series back in March, back in July, any other times that we did a prediction show, I was gun ho about the Dodgers. I felt like I was too pot committed. But you look at their roster up and down. It's like they had they had the most depth on the hitting side and on the pitching side. And to see them kind of uh, not show up on either facet of the uh, of the game, especially uh, with their pitchers, it's kind of it's very disappointing. But just goes to show you: number one, you can never have enough pitching. And number two, uh, these guys are human. They they break exactly. down just like anything. Yep. And I think the problem here, apart from the fact that the Dodgers pitchers are just tired, and I just saw an article that came out and said that um, Dave Roberts came out and said um, having Max Scherzer come out in relief was a mistake. And that was probably what caused him to have the dead arm is because he put him out in relief. Um, anyway, the, the other thing that I wanted to comment on is going back to the offense. I mean, they got – pretty beat up that offense was pretty beat up you had uh justin yeah. turner who was out because of the neck thing and then he had a and then he had that injury that uh, hamstring injury oh, you also yeah. had max muncie who was you know out um all postseason long and so those are two big bats in in the um in the series that are gone Yep. And so now you have two less bats to rely on and puts more pressure on Trey Turner, Corey Seager, Mookie Betts. Now, did we bank on all of their bats disappearing? No. Um, I didn't, I didn't expect their, you know, four of their top hitters to go missing and their best hitters to be Chris Taylor and Cody Bellinger. But I think the fact that Justin Turner and Max Muncy were hurt and, you know, Mookie Betts and all of them didn't show up. It made it, those injuries made it a whole lot harder for them to use that depth as a strength because they were already down players going into the series. Well, and there you have it. That is the 2021 ALCS, NLCS, uh, WPA correctly calling out the MVPs of both series. Uh, lots of uh, shortcomings from uh, some of the big name players, especially from the Dodgers side of things. Some of the pitchers not showing up either uh, and getting hammered. And for the Braves, uh, pretty much it's the same old bullpen that 
a couple of years ago, I was told was never going to amount to anything, was susceptible and weak, and they got the job done. But let's uh, let's so let's look ahead to the World Series. And I got uh, the Fangraphs um, roster resource page up and running. Might I might just go ahead and share this one just so people see what I see. Yeah, let's go ahead and share this puppy up really quick, and that'll be the last thing we'll talk about before we call it a night. Uh, you got something to say over there? Nope. Oh, okay, I thought you were leaning in. So there, here is your starting lineup for your Houston Astros. Jose Altuve at the top of the order, followed by Michael Brantley, Alex Bregman, and, and I'm only calling. Oh, no, nobody can see it. Oh, nobody can see it still. No. no. All right, let me try it again. Here I was thinking I was calling out the names, uh, just uh, for the audio only people. So let's try this again. Um, ba, 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 screen one. Can you see anything now? Uh, I just I just see Penny. I don't see. Well, I don't see the I don't see roster resource. Huh? Maybe maybe I want to show Penny. I don't know. Uh, <laughs> let's see. What what do I? Oh, what the hell? Uh, oh, that's so weird. <laughs> it's kind of funny though to see Penny. All <laughs> right, one more time. I, I, I man, I, oh well, duh. Okay, I'm an idiot. How about now? There you go. All right. I'm always happy to see Penny Penny when she was just a young baby. All right, so let's start over. Jose Altuve at the top of the lineup, followed by Michael Brentley, Alex Bregman, Jordan Alvarez, Carlos Correa, Kyle Tucker, Yuli Gurriel, Chaz McCormick, and Martin Maldonado. Pretty set lineup. Uh, no question uh, who is batting where. Uh, you know, I know you were, I know you or, or was it Melvin complaining about all the different lineup changes? Well, this is as solid as it gets in terms of the lineup itself. And then on the bench, you got Jason Castro, Alec Ms. Diaz, Jake Myers, Jose Siri. So a decent bench, not the greatest of benches that the Astros have uh, unleashed in recent memory, but they're pretty darn good in their own right. And I don't know if this is official or not. I see the X's being marked off, so I have to assume that this is going to be the game one starter for Ambrell Valdez. Are you able to confirm or deny that, Austin? I would assume, I mean, everything I read said that the the most logical pitching matchup is going to be uh, Freed and Valdez. So I would think Valdez would be the game one starter. All right. Followed by Luis Garcia, Jose Urquidy, and then Zach Greinke, if needed. I have a fat, bad feeling that Dusty Baker might just go three-man rotation. Uh, do you see it that way? Do you, or do you think that, that he will have no choice but to bring out Zach Greinke in like a game four, game five situation? I think it depends on how well the first three pitchers do against the Braves. I think if, you know, Valdez and Garcia kind of lay an egg, then he'll probably go out. Then he'll probably throw Granky out there and see what happens. But I mean, when you look at the trend and you see that, um, you see that he didn't use them in uh game in in the championship series. I don't see why he would go to using him a lot in the world series. Um, but like I said, I think it would depend on how good Valdez and Garcia pitch against uh, against the Braves here. Because the other option that the Astros can use is Jake Odorizzi, uh, who's who's now doing the long relief role, which was uh, Zach Greinke's doing uh, at the beginning of these uh, series of these playoffs. Zach Greinke's name showed up at the bottom of this list right here, where Jake Odorizzi's name shows up now. I remember that. Yeah, so but let's take a look, quick look at the bullpen, right? I mean, we we talked about some of these guys already, but it, it's it's a real dominant bullpen, so maybe it doesn't even matter if these starting pitchers are able to perform at a high level because you got Ryan Pressey at the back end in the ninth inning, and then get Kendall Graveman as your eighth inning guy, Ryan Stenek, who's always been a pretty good player, just need a little bit of uh, uh of uh, polish, and what better organization to go to but the Houston Astros, who are just notorious for just whipping these guys into shape. Uh, Brooks Raley also had a pretty decent season from what I remember. Let me see if that's the case or not, because I don't remember. Okay, so a pretty high ERA, so not the way I remember it, but 65 strikeouts and 49 innings pitch. You'll take that. Uh, Christian Javier, that, that's another option to get out of the uh, into the rotation if need me or, or, or uh, bring in long relief as well. Yimi Garcia, uh, Phil Matan, Blake Taylor. I mean, it's a really damn good bullpen, all things considered. Um, so that's their bullpen. Any key injuries, Marvin Gonzalez, it looks like he's inactive Oh, for the ALCS. So who knows? Maybe these aren't, uh, these lineups aren't set quite yet, but you still got Marvin Gonzalez, uh, 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 waiting in the wing, so to speak. Lance McCullers. I know he's out, right? He's out for the, yeah, uh, he is out. I believe he has to have surgery. Okay. So that's, 
that sucks for him. Uh, any any other players worth noting? Justin Verlander, but we already knew about Justin Verlander, Verlander since last year. Uh, and now the, these guys, I'm uh, not going to talk about these other guys here. So there, there's your roster. According to roster resource, as of today, we don't know if that is official. Oh, so you see right here, Austin, at the 2021 projected starter. Uh, so game four, Jake Odorizzi might go against okay. Jesse Chavez. So both teams are are kind of uh, thin at the starting rotation, but they are resetting. As you can see, Charlie Morton on the opposite side of things for the Braves, followed by Max Fried. Then you get a day off on the 28th of October. Then you get Ian Anderson and Jesse Chavez going against Jake Odorizzi. So I don't, I don't know. We'll see. Let's take a look at the Braves. But as of right now, Austin, I'm not seeing any uh, advantage in terms of the starting pitching one way or another, because that's usually the... Uh, uh, the the edge uh, that's usually the uh, how the starting pitching goes that's usually how these teams will go right right but, but this could be really tight I mean let's let me let's, let's play with that right now who do you like in game one Charlie Martin Morton or Frambo Valdez Valdez game two Max Freed versus Luis Garcia who do you like there Freed Ian Anderson versus Jose or Quidi Anderson Jesse Chavez versus Jake Odorizzi oh that one's tough um I don't know on that one. Um, I'd say Odorizzi pulls it out. I think that I think for Chavez and Odorizzi, I think that'll just be who kind of lasts four innings and does decent. But I think Odorizzi will do a little bit better than Chavez. And then it starts over again with uh, Morton and Valdez. So you like Valdez the first game. I got to assume you like him in game five. So now the Astros lead 3-2. Max Reed versus Luis Garcia. I think you said you took both Max Reed and Ian Anderson. So if we are to go with this game, this little simple game we're playing with Austin here, looks like the Braves are going to win in seven. Is that your intent there, Austin? Oh, that that's tough because Do you want to I mean, see the roster first before you make. Yeah, a I want to I want to see the roster. But based on the starting pitching, I mean, do you see this game, uh, this series going seven games based on the starting pitching? Uh, matches based on the starting front? pitching, I could definitely see this going seven games. Yeah, that's what it's starting to look like a little bit. And lots of things have to go the Astros way. Because, yeah, you have to like the advantage that Max Fried and Ian Anderson have going for themselves. But the Astros are pretty damn sneaky. So maybe yeah. it's their pitchers that are, are cheating. We'll never know. <laughs> for the Braves, according to Roster Resource, as of today, Monday night, uh, Eddie Rosario at the top of the lineup. Man, Eddie Rosario, World Series li uh, leadoff hitter. I, I, I thought I would never see the day. Ooh. Ozzy Albies batting second, Freddie Freeman batting third, uh, Austin Riley batting fourth, Adam Duvall batting fifth, Jock Peterson with his pearls uh, doing the platoon batting sixth, along with Jorge Soler, assuming that he's healthy. Uh, Dansby Swanson just shortstop, and then the, the eighth hitter is Travis Darno. Uh, the bench for the Braves, you got William Contreras, who's an up and coming uh, catching prospect, the brother of Wilson Contreras. Johan Camargo, who's a Swiss Army knife. He could play multiple positions if need be. Uh, Iheri Adrianza. Uh, he's, oh, I didn't realize he was 32 years old already, so that means uh, I'm getting up there in age as well. <laughs> Orlando Garcia, who we talked a little bit too much in a previous podcast with Austin, like then, former Milwaukee Brewer. Guillermo Heredia, who is a super sub in the outfield for this team. And then, of course, Jorge Soler, the big bat. Um, uh, the big bat uh, on the right-hand side of, off the bench. There's your starters, Charlie Morton, Max Fried, Ian Anderson, the only three short locks in this rotation. So now it gets really dicey. Now we got to talk to see maybe there's an edge here on the bullpen. I don't know. I was impressed with the Astros bullpen. So let's take it name by name, player by player, the bullpen for your Atlanta Braves. Will Smith getting jiggy with it at the closer position. Luke Jackson, the eighth inning guy. We just talked about him uh, shitting the bet in the previous NLCS that just passed. Tyler Matzek, the good field story of the year. Jacob Webb, who I barely remember, but I don't, he don't impress me much. 33 strikeouts in 34 innings, gave up 38 hits in that span. So that might be a red flag. AJ Minter, there's a good guy right there. 57 strikeouts in 52 innings. Jesse Chavez, who we just talked about him uh, being a potential game four starter. We'll see if that happens. Chris Martin, I believe, uh, what, former, yeah, former Ranger. Right, right, right. Uh, he don't impress me much. Dylan Lee, uh, he must be new to the game here because I don't recognize him. Drew Smiley, the man with like the one million surgeries on his left arm. Um, <laughs> yeah, 
So, th- so that's basically Drew Smiley is their version of Jake Odorizzi, uh, the way yeah. we saw it on the roster. I would, I would, I would agree with that. Yeah. All right. And who are they missing? Uh, Christian Pache, Terrence Gore, who's uh, we know Terrence Gore uh, wreaking havoc on the base pass with the Royals that one year. Christian Pache, a very athletic prospect, but look at that. 111 at batting average. He can't figure out the things yeah. that are coming his way, unfortunately. Yeah. Uh, Oscar Yanoa is missing in action. Richard Rodriguez, who was acquired by the Pirates, also uh, missing in action in the NLCS. So I don't know what their deal is at this point. Uh, are they injured? I'm not sure, but there must be a reason why they were uh, not included in the NLCS. Ronald Acuna, of course, we know about his situation. Mike Soroka, we know about his situation. And so on and so forth. Marcelo Zuna still on administrative leave, so to speak, uh, getting the Trevor Bauer treatment over there. So, um, yeah. What do you think of the the roster here? Uh, It's tough. Um, I think when you compare it to the Astros lineup. So, obviously, I've already said that the starting pitching – I think the advantage a little leans a little bit towards the Braves. But when you look at the bullpen, I think the advantage leans towards the Astros. Yeah, same. When you look at the offense, I think the offense for each team both has the same problem. Okay. Mm. So you've got people that are producing but you also have big bats in the championship series that have not produced. So um, you're looking at um, on the Astro side, you're looking at probably um, Kyle Tucker, maybe to step up, even though he had a good series, obviously for the WPA, he didn't step up when he needed to. Um, And then the other one you're probably looking at needing to step up. Oh, is Bregman is the other one that you need him to step up as well and figure it out. Yeah. Right. So, but on the brave side, you have Eddie Rosario and you have um, uh, Austin Riley who is uh, stepping up, but, and I don't really foresee a good world series from Ozzy Albies for the same reason that he didn't have a good championship series because they're going to play that matchup. Mm -hmm. They're going to play the, they're going to try and keep him on the left in the left-handed batter's box. I think the key for the Braves is going to be if, Freddie Freeman can find it and lower his strikeouts and maybe get on base a little more. I think on top of if Freddie Freeman produces a little more with, you know, Jock Peterson, Austin Riley and Eddie Rosario producing like they should, the the Braves might have a shot. But again, on the other side, if the Astros, if Kyle Tucker and Alex Bregman can produce a little more when they need to, then they might have the slight edge. This one is going to be really, really tough. I think this is going to this is going to be a very, very interesting series. Yeah, I was just thinking about what you were saying. I, I gotta give a slight edge to the Braves, but it's not a big edge because once those first few games go out of the way, anything can happen in Game Five, Game Six, and maybe even, even yeah. Game Seven if need be. Exactly. Uh, and we've seen Luis Garcia and Framber Valdez step up when their team needed to the most. So, and then Jose Arquiti is no slouch either, but yeah, compared to Ian Anderson, um, yeah, Ian Anderson just seems to uh, fit the mold for that uh, prototype pitcher that you're looking for in these situations. But I've also seen Ian Anderson kind of not choke, but not come through in big situations either. Right. So it's not like we're, we're seeing some world beaters here. And Max Reed definitely got shelled in that last series as well. So yes. nothing's guaranteed here. Uh, so this, but I still give a, a name alone. And uh, expectations. I will give the slight edge to the uh, to the Bravos there. The bullpen. I mean, I I I spew I spewed out the names. I am just more impressed by the Astros bullpen. No doubt about it. No question in my mind that they uh, definitely have the much better bullpen coming into the series. It, it, it's a murderer's row. And you mentioned Ozzy Alves. I mean, there's a lot of big arm big velocity right-handed pitchers on this bullpen that will neutralize Ozzy Alves. If that is the situation uh, that will present itself in the series, then yeah, Alves might con- uh, continue to, to struggle in these playoffs. And then that leads to the hitting, which, I mean, these hitters for the Astros, they've been there before. And I don't want to use that as a, as a crutch, as a, as my, you know, my big reason as to why the Astros all oh, was the experience factor and blah, 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 blah. But they they do have a track record. And I'll even go as far as saying that their track record and overall scope of careers for some of these guys on the Astros team, much grander than the Braves, even with the Braves having a former MVP and Freddie Freeman. 
and a thirty and a, and a potential thirty thirty guy in Asi Albis and and the M, uh, NLCS MVP and Eddie Rosario. But uh, overall, I mean, they've done it before. Like I said, I don't want to use that as my only reason. But I mean, it, it, they're they're the bigger names. I mean, they I talked about it time and time again with you and and uh, Sean. They know how to limit their strikeouts. They know how to make perfect contact. Even even Vince, who's uh, uh, he posted on something uh, and. Uh, in Dong City, it sounds like they're going to go either tomorrow night or Wednesday night. So we'll check out their uh, show as well. But even Vince was, he could not say a bad thing about the Astros in the series because the Astros hitters are everything he wishes his Yankees could be. Limiting strikeouts, knowing when to take a pitch, kn- knowing how to draw walks. This team does it. They're posting high on base percentages. The Astros just do it. Now, there might be a question mark about Chas McCormick. All right, well. Adam Duvall was nowhere to be found in the NLCS. Jock Peterson is a platoon player, yep. even with the Pearls. Dansby Swanson, I, I mean, 311 on base percentage. I mean, is Amber the color of his energy? <laughs> you get it? Yes, I got it. I All got right. you. <laughs> so, and, and Travis Darno too. He, he didn't show up either. So. Yeah. Uh, in terms of offense, I'll take Darno over Maldonado. But, in, I mean, we saw the – difference maker that Maldonado was behind that played in the, in, in these playoffs for the Astros. So yep. uh, they'll, they'll live with his bad uh, batting skills. If it means uh, that he gives them a chance to uh, uh, keep his pitchers in the game, you know, and all those other intangibles. So with all that being said, uh, I have to give these edge on offense, the hitters to the Astros as well. And I'm going to go ahead and say Astros in six. And I'm gonna and I'm, and I'm gonna write it down. I'm gonna I'm gonna comment with that, Austin. I'm gonna make it official. Okay. So feel free to make it official on your end as well. Yeah. So I'm gonna. So one thing that I wanted, and I posted it in the baseball life group today, was uh, for those of you that don't know, I am a teacher. Um, so that is my day job. And today I actually did a math lesson because they're learning division. So I had a math lesson of, and we just looked at basic stats. We looked at runs per game and runs allowed per game. And we tried to um, predict who was going to win the world series based off of those two, um, those two statistics runs allowed per game and runs per game. And at the beginning, it was really interesting because without really seeing, I think um, the only stat that they saw was that the Astros scored 71 runs in their championship series compared to the Braves who only scored 40, 44 or something like that in their, in their series. So at that point I had asked them, who do you think is going to win? 17 of my kids thought that the Astros were going to win and only six thought that the Braves were going to win. But as we started, you know, doing the math and, hmm. um, really started, you know, showing, you know, doing, doing different math and seeing that everything else was, uh, was equal in terms of runs allowed and runs per game in both the postseason and the regular season. It ended up being that my class thought the Braves were going to win by a vote of 12 to 11. Right. So it was mm. very, it was very split. And at that point, the kids asked me, well, you're the baseball guy. What do you think? And so I was like, you know, this one is really hard. And I tried to break it down just in front of them in layman's terms, because most of them don't watch baseball. And so at the time I had said, I think the Braves will win. But now that I'm looking at these, I'm actually looking at the rosters and, you know, we've talked about this for the last hour or so. It's really hard. And I saw a stat earlier, or I saw, um, I I guess you can call it a stat. They, um, Jose Altuve, Alex Bregman, Carlos Correa, and Yuli Gurriel have played 79 postseason games together as teammates, which is the second most, I believe it was 79. It was somewhere around there. The second most behind four Yankees in all time, or all time, Derek Jeter, Derek Jeter, uh, Tino Martinez. Um, oh, I, rem- I, I had all four of them. Anyway, they were four Yankees and they had 99 games. So when you look at that, that playoff experience, it's, it's really hard to bet against that playoff experience. And you're right. It's really hard to bet against the Astros offense that does limit their strikeouts and walk right on top of the shaky bullpen that, you know, or I guess the shaky year bullpen that the um, Braves have, 
I, I, I'd, I'll go Astros too, but I'm going to say Astros in seven. Oh, so, okay. I so, might make sure, mark it down. I'm going to mark it down. I'm going to put it on there right now. I'm going to say Astros in seven. Sorry, kids. I changed my mind. <gasps> it's not, I, I, I'm going to change my mind to the Astros and not the Braves. So sorry for all of you that voted for the Braves. <laughs> well, there you have it. Uh, I hope we did a good job of it trying to break down uh, the previous series and this upcoming series. It should be a dandy. I mean, six games, seven games. I mean, that's, that's already a pretty darn good series. I know that the, uh, that the TV networks get a lot of money when it goes that far into the, yep. into the, uh, into the series anyway. So uh, let's see here. Uh, da, 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 da. So there they might, uh, let's see if this game does go into five or six games, we might be looking at a possible Halloween night, Halloween night baseball action. Oh, well, there you go. I think. Yeah. Right. Two games and then the off game, oh, but that should be if necessary. Yeah, you might see Halloween night and then maybe some Mr. November heroics. So uh, let's keep going. Uh, we'll do one more thing and then we'll call it quits. So we're near that end here. Who's your World Series MVP? Oh, man. Why do you got to ask me that? Uh, it just uh, dawned on me to to kind of uh, ask. Um, Alvarez. Oh, again. Again. I think he goes twice. Jordan Alvarez. Yeah, it's hard not to pick a an a, a hitter here. Who boy, you know, I thought I had an answer, and I and I find out that I don't. <laughs> um, it's got. Oh boy, I might kill myself here. Oh, okay. Uh, gun to my head, Kyle Tucker. You know what? He was my he was my second choice. I almost said Tucker, but I think Alvarez edges him out. I was about to say Frambo Valdez, but man, the way these pitchers are going and the way they're being given that quick hook, I doubt that. And then the Braves, they might get to him as well in one of these games. So maybe not, maybe I'm not as confident. But you know, we saw Tucker had a pretty good series in, in the uh, NLCS. So maybe maybe it, it, the voters will notice and they'll reward him. All they got to do is if, is if Carlos Correa gets on base, then that gives Kyle Tucker a chance to, uh, at the very least, uh, boost up his WPA. Because yeah. it, it, otherwise, because Jordan Alvarez is ruining it for him. He's, he keeps clearing the bases for everybody behind him. So, yeah. So we'll see. All right, Austin. Well, thank you so much for uh, tuning in. Uh, tell the folks once again where they can find uh, your podcast. All right. So I am the host of the round trippers podcast. You can find us on Spotify. Um, right now I'm going once a week when it comes to the, uh, off season, I will probably not go once a week, but right now we are doing once a week until the end of the season. Uh, you can find us on Spotify, Google podcasts, anywhere that you are, um, or you can find me um, anywhere that you listen to podcasts. You can also find us on Twitter at round underscore trippers. Um, yeah, I think that's pretty much it. Yeah, you can also find, yeah, definitely check out Austin on Twitter. Give him a follow. You can follow me on Twitter as well at pathological underscore the letter H, the number eight. Uh, and also Spotify, Apple Podcasts under the Life Group Podcast moniker. We are the Total Basis Podcast. We have other sports podcasts that we talk, uh, that we uh, cycle in on a regular basis. We have a football, basketball, check us out. We have the other baseball podcast that's, I think it has to, uh, they're going to go on tomorrow because that's when the World Series starts. It starts tomorrow. So enjoy the uh, next week of baseball games, and we will see you guys soon. Take good care, everybody. See you later, everybody.